with us this morning. So without no further ado, let's go straight into our testimony from our brother, Jaron. Over to you. Brilliant. All right. My name is Jerome. Um, yeah, let's start off from the beginning. So I was born in Sidcup, Kent, back in 1992. Um, my mum and my dad and my two older sisters. Um, my dad left when I was about three years old or two years old. And my mum ended up getting with my stepdad at the time when I was about three. Um, I had a bit of a... I'd say it was um, it can be a bit of a rough childhood. My parents were both in addiction, um, so they did the best that they could with the circumstances that they were in. But you know, I don't blame them for anything. I'm just yeah, there was no hard feelings between me and them. As I got older though, I noticed there was a change in them because they came to God when I was about five years old. I saw a difference in them. And before my very eyes, they started changing and becoming different people. And they introduced me to God as well. And to me, that was the best thing that could ever have happened to me. Um, I started, well, I say I started reading the Bible, but I started listening to cassette tapes with the New Testament. And they were very dramatized. And I used to love that as a kid. I'd go to sleep just listening to Matthew or Revelations like every night. And it was just... It was a wonderful experience. Um, fast forward to, to about 15. Um, during them years, I'll be honest with you, nothing really happened. We moved a lot. I don't know why, but we always seemed to move from house to house to house to house. Um, when we was 15, we ended up moving abroad and I went to Spain. And in Spain, um, I got a job um, as a scuba diving. I don't know, you could call me an instructor, but... I wasn't qualified. I wasn't getting paid, but he would teach me and put me through the qualifications in order for me to work for him. So yeah, that was beautiful. I sometimes go to church. There was a Spanish church, but it's full of English people. So it was quite easy to understand and not, you know, have the Spaniards talking. Um, but there was, I remember there was this one guy and he was just, filled with the Holy Spirit. It was absolutely shining, man. And it, it took me aback because he always used to say stuff like, oh, my, my daddy in heaven or my, my father in heaven. And he had such a close relationship with God. And I'd never seen that before. It was, it was unique in such a way. And he just, his whole aura was just about love and it was peaceful and it was beautiful. He got a mission from God. God spoke to him and said that he needs to get a sailboat and go across the ocean to Papua New Guinea and start ministering over there. And so I would go and help him. It was a second-hand boat. I'd go and help him sand it down and stuff like that. And the stuff that I learned from this guy was invaluable. Um, I remember he asked me to climb to the top of the mast. I said to him, look, I'm not, not going to do that. I'm, I'm afraid of ice. And he said to me, you don't need to be afraid. Fear doesn't come from God, it comes from the devil. You have to overcome every single fear, every stronghold that the devil's put in place. On the other side of fear, God has put the greatest things in life, and you need to overcome these fears. And then he told me a story that will always stick with me. He said one day he was out sailing, and the wind's getting choppy and the waves, and he was overcome with fear. But then he, he remembered the written word, and what he did is he stood at the front of the boat, and he rebuked the waves, and they calmed. I remember listening to this story and thinking, nah, that couldn't have been. But to this day, I truly believe that actually happened. Um, we did move from Spain eventually, so I was 15 at the time. Fast forward till 19 years old. Um, we moved back to England. I didn't really have any GCSEs or anything like that. I didn't complete anything. I was just, I suppose, your 18-year-old bum or 19-year-old bum. Living at home, I had a bit of an altercation with the parents and I got kicked out. Um, when I got kicked out, I went to a hostel and that was my first introduction to a life away from, 
I suppose you could call a sheltered life almost. Well, I wouldn't say sheltered. It, was, it wasn't sheltered, but yeah, it was an introduction to what the world was really like. And drugs were a massive problem in my life for a good six years. Um, I call it the debauchery stages, the paganism stage. The I was a yeah. I was a, so by the age of twenty four, um, I was heavily in addiction, despair, hopelessness. I wanted to commit suicide, but I didn't have the guts to do it. I knew God existed, but I didn't have that close relationship with him like I ought to. And so what I did is I fasted. I just fasted. I didn't get up, go to work. I just closed my curtains and I just stayed there and I prayed and I fasted. And the next thing I know, my sister calls me and says, do you want to come move down to London? So I moved back down to London. I was in the Forest of Dean at the time. So I moved back down to London lived with my nan and I met my then missus and her son. Um, yeah, it wasn't a bad relationship. It was a bit back and forth, but eventually um, she sort of found out exactly what I was doing behind closed doors. I'm not going to get too much into that, but <clears throat> it wasn't a great experience for her or me. Um, I did end up getting a job at the age of 25 and it was, I was going for a stage of money, power, and it all stemmed from my insecurities as a kid because I was bullied. Uh, I couldn't quite fit into anywhere. I was, I'm obviously mixed race, so white people didn't like me too much. Black people didn't like me too much. I was sort of in the middle and I had to try and find my way. Um, but yeah, I found this job which had a lot of money, a lot of power. It was a sales job. And I'll go out and I'll talk to these people. There was this one guy, I remember. Um, I thought I was a very confident person. I've always believed I was a confident person. I could talk to women. I was very good with people. I thought I was yeah, the dog's cojones, really. really. <laughs> and then this, this guy was walking up to me and he was wearing a nice three-piece suit. And I was wearing a suit as well. And I was like, oh, they're nice, man. Looking very fresh today, my man. And as he spoke to me, there was something oddly different about him. He was very congruent. He had a, a confidence that I've never experienced before. It wasn't the confidence that I could portray as coming off as confident. His was the very core in confidence. There was a bit of peace about him. And it put me on my back foot. I remember being a bit intimidated by this guy. And then he says to me, he says, um, I'm a Christian. I was like, oh, okay. He was like, do you want to come to my church one day? I was like, yeah, I suppose so. I'd, I'd love to. Gave me his number. And uh, we didn't speak for about five months. Five months later, I lost my job. They caught me drinking uh, on my job. So I lost my job. About a month later, my missus split up with me, stepson. I had 80 quid to my pocket, in my pocket. I was in addiction. I lost my house. And so I was on the streets. And uh, I went, I brought a sleeping bag, some fags and whatnot, and some bits and bobs. And it was in December, and it was freezing cold, man. It was in Croydon in London. And I was, I was freezing cold. This, this sleeping bag wasn't doing anything. I had no friends because I just didn't have many mates, if I'm being honest. I moved a lot and in my sales job, you don't really make a lot of friends. It's, they want steps on each other to get to the higher place. And I decided to give this guy a call, this Christian guy that I met, met when I was doing my sales. I've called him up and I've I spoke to him. I've said, look, um, I've got nowhere to stay. And he was like, right. I'll give you an ultimatum. You can come sleep on my sofa as long as you come to church with me on Sunday. I was like, yeah, okay, no problem. It was on the Friday, I went over there, slept on his sofa. Saturday, I went into the council. 
and got a, a sheet, a list of all the places that I could try and live or sleep or night shelters just to ring up. And on the Sunday, he took me to church. I wasn't expecting this massive, humongous church of about five to 600 people. It's a Pentecostal church. I think it was called like Winner's Church or something like that. It's full of people to the eye. As far as the eye could see, and there was all these TV cameras. And I'm standing with this guy who let me stay on his sofa. And I couldn't quite understand um, the vicar uh, or the preacher or the pastor because he had such a strong African accent. But then as he was speaking, I did hear a line. He said, if you want to give your life to God, he said, you should come to the front. So I was like, no, nah, there's, there's not a chance I'm going to come up to the front. Not, not an absolute chance. Anyway, Hilary, the guy that I was with, he started jabbing me in the ribs. I was like, no, nah, I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. He started jabbing me even more. And then the TV camera comes upon me. And I was like, oh, no, I'm forced into this. So I was like, do you know what? Why not? So what I did is I, I walked. And it was about a 30 second walk. It's a very big church. And as I'm walking up there, I'm thinking to myself, I mean, come on, man, giving your life to God isn't a bad thing. You have nothing left. You're in depression. You don't, you don't have anything. You've lost your job. You've lost your missus, your stepson, your, your house, everything. And so as I stood before this vicar, I was like, you know what, I'm going to surrender. And that's what I did. I surrendered right there. And then he said, repeat after me and say these words. I can't remember exactly what the words were, but I remember the feeling. I remember the, the weight that was lifted off of me. Now I understood that, you know, being in addiction, losing your missus and whatever that was, there was a weight that needed to be lifted off, but I didn't understand the deeper level of weight. There was something much deeper that I didn't realize I had a more hindering burden underneath me that had been lifted off. And as it had been lifted off, this peace overcame me with such power. I, I now know that it's called the Holy Spirit, but at the time I didn't know what it was. And I was hit with such power. And at that very moment, the only thing that mattered was Jesus. And that was it. It didn't matter that I was homeless. It didn't matter that I had nothing to my name. Just feeling that peace and that love and that joy in a second, in an instant, everything else just didn't matter. The problems I thought I had were not problems anymore. And I was just filled head to toe with the Holy Spirit. Anyway, um, the next day I go out. Um, I start looking for a place to live. And God works in mysterious and wonderful ways. And I'm looking through this list and I'm going through this list that the council has given me and I'm phoning people up and seeing if there's a place for me to stay for the night, if there's a food bank. And I come across in Croydon Gardens every Wednesday, I believe it is, or every Tuesday or Monday or something. At seven o'clock, they give out food bank. I'm filled with the Holy Spirit and I go there. And as I go there, I'm just eager to talk about God to anyone. And uh, <laughs> I start sitting down, I'm talking to these guys about God, we're getting our food. And the guys that were given, handing the food out were actually Christians. And so they stood in a circle and they started praying. And I sort of sheepishly walked over and I was like, is, is it all right if I join as well? And they were like, yeah, come on in, man, come on in. Hold their hands, we start praying, the fire of the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And the next thing I know, I'm starting preaching to them. I'm starting preaching about trials and tribulations <laughs> or what I knew about the Bible. Whenever I've read the Bible, it's always been like the first four chapters in the Old Testament, a bit of Matthew and John, revelations from when I was a kid and some proverbs. I didn't know anything. In fact, I always thought that living by the Ten Commandments was the only way to live. So I started preaching about trials and tribulations to these guys that were handing out the food. And I was so filled with the Holy Spirit that he looked at me very oddly. I was like, what's the matter? And he was like, are you an angel? I said to him, no, I'm just, I'm just a homeless dude filled with the Holy Spirit, man. That's, that's all I am. And then he starts telling me that God uses the people that you don't expect him to use. He doesn't go for the politicians or the kings or these higher up people. He always uses the meek and holy, the people that have nothing. And then he exalts them because they humble themselves before him. 
and it really um yeah it really changed my life well um I oh, don't let me find my notes but yeah I took a load of food they gave me a load of food to give they gave me a load of food they just absolutely blessed me or should I say God bless me they had bags of this food and they just gave it to me and like here I'll take this and so I took it I ate a little bit of it I couldn't eat all of it and it was about four it must have been about six o'clock and um, I'm looking the whole day, the next day, I'm looking the whole day for someone to sleep, someone to live, just anything, just just a night shelter, just somewhere to keep me out of the streets. And I spent the whole day going around London looking for a place to sleep. Um, in the end, I ended up in a place called Purley. And I've got there and I'm thinking that it's going to be a night shelter and they're going to be able to house me. But as I've got there, <clears throat> um, I found that the place was closed. And so I was upset, to say the least. I almost cried. Um, well, if I'm being honest, I probably did cry. Um, I sat down and I sort of wept a little bit. I, I called out to God. I was like, God, I'm, I'm at the end of my tether here. I'm, I'm at my last thread. I need you. I need you. And something came upon me and it was like, just give, give this number a call. I flipped through these pages. It was about... 80 odd different numbers and I just looked at one and I was like I'll give these a call and so I did I called him and it was a nice guy I think his name is Chris I can't really remember and he was like yeah 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 there's a guy that's supposed to be coming over he said um he's supposed to be there for seven o'clock if he doesn't turn up and doesn't arrive at eight o'clock then we'll give the space to you I was like okay I was like awesome thank you so much um he said where are you I said I was in Purley. He says, okay, uh, we're in Crawley, which is about two stops. I looked it up online. It's about two stops. She was like, if you can get here before seven o'clock and pray in that he doesn't, you know, turn up, you can have his spot. I was like, oh, brilliant. So I put the phone down. I praised God. I was like, thank you, God. And as I've looked around, I, did, I didn't realise I was in such a beautiful area. I remember looking at all these houses and then, multi-million pound houses and I was like wow I'd love to live here one day anyway I've got on the train and as I've got on the train I've gone to Crawley I didn't realise it was outside of London now we use oyster cards in London and what happens is you go outside of London you can't use an oyster card to get out you have to use cash but I didn't have any cash so I ended up at this barrier I started pressing the oyster card and it wouldn't let me through and I was like what's, what's going on here the guy looked at me and he told me about the oyster cards. I don't know why, but he looked at me, he looked at my bags and he was like, go on, go through. And he lifted up the barrier and he let me through and he just said, top up your oyster card because you'll have to pay 20 quid or something uh, in debt. So I did. I went to Crawley. Lo and behold, the guy didn't turn up. I was eating. He, he gave me soup. The guy didn't turn up. And I had to be seen, so they let me in and I had a place to stay. Out, out of the cold and in this nice warm house. And as I've gone in there, they've asked me if I got my passport. It's like, passport? What do you need my passport for? He said, this is a halfway house. It means that we're going to house you until we can find somewhere for you permanently. <laughs> and yeah, I, I did break down and cry because I didn't expect that. I just thought it was a night show. I just thought it was a one night. They feed you, they give you a shower and some few clothes. I didn't realise I'd be staying there. Um, God is good, man. God is good. So I stayed about a month there in Crawley. Um, I'll be honest with you. I wasn't doing drugs at the time, but I was drinking. Um, the desire to do drugs wasn't as prominent as it was before. You could say I was cured. But my later life suggests that I wasn't. Anyway. So I ended up in High Wycombe and I loved God. I knew that I had this experience with him, but I just wouldn't read my Bible. I would watch YouTube videos about God. I would listen to other people's views on God and I would learn from them instead of just picking up my Bible and finding out for myself firsthand who God was. And so I was living by the Ten Commandments. And I'm not perfect, man. 
I never will be a perfect man. But as I'm living by the Ten Commandments, I'm trying to be this good man, but I'm so sinful at the same time. And so every night I'll get this fear, this dread that Jesus was going to come back at any time. And he's going to look at me and say, look, you're going to hell straight away. You cannot follow my Ten Commandments. You're, you're toast. You're in hell, eternal damnation. I used to get this anxiety, this fear, and I used to wake up in panic attacks. Attack. And this caused me to use as well, because it was the only way I could shut off my mind from doing it. But then I do it, I felt guilty, and I feel more condemned. And it was a vicious cycle. One day, um, I was sitting there praying to God, asking for forgiveness again. And there was a massive lightning storm, a thunderstorm. Now, me thinking that God was going to come back at any second, at any moment, just a loud bang or, you know, a scuttle behind the door. And I was just terrified that God was coming back. <laughs> it was my bad. But this loud thunderstorm. And I remember closing the curtains and praying to God. And this lightning bolt hit the top of my house and it shook the whole place. And I ended up face down on the floor, just crying out to God like, I'm so sorry, I, sh I shouldn't be like this. I should be better. And um, yeah, in the end, I spent a year there and I moved to Crawley. I moved back there to West Sussex, moved to Crawley. I got a job and I would read my Bible and I would try to be a good Christian man, but I would fail every single day countless times. And this took a toll on me. In the end, I um, I fasted again because I couldn't feel the presence of God, not any inkling of God, just despair and hopelessness. I was limp. I fasted for the day and I was listening to Christian TikTok. And on Christian TikTok, there was a song it was called Most Beautiful, and it was a cover done by Joseph Solomon. And it was just a 60-second clip, and it would just replay and replay. And as I'm talking to God and asking him, I have an open-eyed vision, open-eyed vision. And in this vision, I can see Jesus, and he's wearing some, some robe. And it was, um, it, was, it was white, but it had red and blue, like the heart. You see the heart. And that red and that distinct red and blue, and the swirly colors just around the hem and dots. I don't, I don't know what that meant, but in my vision, he was walking away. I'm like, Lord, why are you forsaking me? And he stops and he bends down and he picks something up and he turns around and he starts walking towards me. And I'm looking at his hands, trying to understand what it is. That he's got in his hands and it was like a, a petri dish it was like a, a stone dish and he dips his thumb in it and it's got oil in it what he does he puts his thumb in it and he just puts it on my head and i thought it was going to be a cross but it wasn't it was a weird sign it was like a, a j with a three for it or a one with a three for it it's it proper weird and as he said i've come out of this vision and i'm just hit with this encompassing love this This love beyond, sorry, this love beyond anything I've ever experienced in my life. It was so deep, it was so unending, so wonderful. I just wept for about 40 minutes. And as I'm weeping, Psalms 23 is coming to my head. And I've never read Psalms, I've read Proverbs, and I've read all these other books. I've never read Psalms, and so I look through my Bible to Psalms 23, and I'll read it to you now. And the thing that stuck out to me the most was, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And to this very day, every time that I see that, um, I know that God is talking to me directly, and it's such a, a well-known one. 
So like every time God is talking to me, right? I think that's a beautiful thing me and him have. But anyway, um, I was made homeless again, COVID, lost my job. And I ended up living in Gloucestershire. And I was still living by the Ten Commandments. Still hadn't opened my Bible, still listening to videos on YouTube about Jesus and learning through that way. But that vital information that I needed, I did not hear. And so I was slowly sinking back into my addictive state. And um, I got a place, and that place that I lived in for about a year, it was an unspeakable place. It was then by the end of the time that I got kicked out. I remember laying in bed and I cried to God. I was about 29 at the time. Yeah, 29, 28 or 29. I cried out to God in my despair and hopelessness because I couldn't stop the drugs. I didn't want to be here. Um, I, was, I was like, God, help me. So I was made homeless two days later. <laughs> so, okay. I had no money. I was like, okay, this is this is a good start. It's, it's better than being in this drug in the house. Um, the guy that I was made homeless with, um, a friend of mine now, um, still in contact, he introduced me to his pastor. Um, I was like, oh, wonderful. So we go to this pastor's uh, church every day and we'll talk about God and he'll try and help us to get a place to live. He recommended that we apply for a rehab. I was like, okay, rehabilitation. I wasn't really fussed to begin with, but then he said, it's a Christian rehab. I was like, okay, that's more my sort of cup of tea. So weeks go by, um, my friend ended up going into that rehab. And then I get a call saying that I can go in there a week later. I also get a call saying that YMCA want to take you in. So I was left with this ultimatum, like whether I should go to rehab or whether I should go to this YMCA. And I start praying to God. And I pray to God and about two seconds later, the phone rings and I pick it up and it's the pastor and he says, I was just thinking, I was thinking you should definitely go to this Christian rehab. I was like, okay, if that's not a sign, God, then I don't know what is. So I went to this Christian rehab and it was the first time where I felt that I could actually talk about God. I didn't feel unevenly yoked with the people that I was hanging around with. I could actually openly talk about God. And uh, there was this one guy that I met and I told him about my experience with the Holy Spirit. And he was like, oh, I want a bit of that. I'm like, I want a slice of that. And so we'd done the, the program together, I suppose. You should speak, so to speak. But as I've done this program, I delved into my Bible for the first time properly. I actually read my Bible because there was nothing else to do except for read this Bible, do the program and watch TV or hit the gym. Instead, I just read this Bible. And we'd do devotional every morning. That's how we'd wake up. We'd wake up, we'd go do devotional. And one of the guys there that runs the place, um, beautiful man of God, absolutely stunning man of God, filled to the brim with the Holy Spirit, knew his word. He was a pastor at the time, great man of God. He said the words that I needed to hear, the words that I've been so desperately wanting to hear all my life. It's not by works that you are saved, but by grace. It's not by what you do. It's about your trust in God that will save you. It's about repenting and believing in him who has done it all for you. And that you should take on this anointing. And these are the words I needed to hear. And it was in the morning that this was said. And I just thought about it, dwelling on it all day. All day I was dwelling on it. And I was sitting in the front room and all of a sudden this storm, like this wind just comes into the front room and it starts blowing up. It's very hot wind. And we've all looked at each other. All me and the other residents have looked at each other. We've run outside. And as we've run outside, we can see this monstrous cloud. Um, perfect conditions for a tropical storm. 
and the fear of dread came over me again. The fear of you know, Jesus' return, the dread came over me. And I ran inside and I sat down. And instead of fear, God spoke to me and he said, go outside and face your fears. So I did. I went out there, equipped now with the knowledge that I do now. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Greater is he who is in me than he is in the world. I will be the head and not tail. And I went out there for 20 minutes. I stood in the face of this storm that would have petrified me. And I went ham on this whole, on, on this storm, man, talking the word of God, speaking, authority, walking around, saying, no, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And I walked, and I walked, and I stomped around this car park, just speaking the word of God over me. And this storm, it came over the top of me, looming. And then it went past and the wind died down and I didn't have to deal with it. And God said to me in that moment, he said, even though you walk through the shadow of the valley of death, you shall fear no evil. It doesn't matter, even though you may face death or it may look like a scary thing, it's not going to affect you because I am with you. You don't need to fear. If I put you in a position where you need to face your fears, Nine times out of ten, never have to face them because I am with you and do it for you. And after that situation, after that moment, I delved deep into my Bible and everything just seemed to work out. Um, I started up my own Bible studies. I'd read the night before and then the next day I'd bring it to a Bible studies. It started off with only one person. Just one person would come to my Bible study. By the end of it, by the anointing and blessing of God, we had 80% of the residents start coming to this Bible study. Even some of the, <laughs> the people that worked there would come just to listen to what the word of God had to say. And it was just, it was all through the anointing of God, the, the beauty of God. There was um, a guy that I told you earlier that wanted to experience the Holy Spirit. In that place, he did. He was worshipping God. And what I didn't know, and he told me later, is that he had been praying every night to experience the Holy Spirit and God being a gracious God and a wonderful God. One day, as he was worshipping, he raised up his hands and he just surrendered to God. He let go. And as he did, he was hit with the Holy Spirit. So much so <laughs> that he thought he was on fire and started running out of the hallway, taking off his clothes because he had been hit so hard by the Holy Spirit. Me and him became good friends, um, and we'd always talk about God because we were just so in love with God, and that's all we ever did was just love and talk about God. Um, God was anointed and moving in that place. We saw miracles happen, prophecies fulfilled in that. Well, I say prophecies. There was prophetic words. We knew the next day what the Bible verse was going to be before it would happen. God would just put something on our heart, and we'd be like, yeah, that's what they're going to do, the devotional one the next day. I saw healings, people being healed. There was a guy with a broken hand who'd come up and they healed him in the name of Jesus. And it was a beautiful place to be in because God was just dwelling through us in that place. And it was wonderful. But eventually the program had to end. I came out into the real world and it wasn't like a bubble of God. And I had to try and force myself to love God out here as well. Eventually I ended up where I am now. And I've prayed for some good brothers around me to help me in this walk. And as usual, God has delivered. I have wonderful brothers around me. But I'm going to leave it here. But if I was going to leave you with one last message, pick up your Bible. For goodness sake, read it. Everything that you need to know about a, a wonderful, merciful, gracious Savior. This love story between you and God is in there. He's not sending you to hell because of what you've done you're already going to hell what he's saying is he's making a way out for you just pick up your bible it's a phone call directly to god i'll leave it there thank you guys amen thank you jaron that was absolutely beautiful very touching very heartfelt very real just uh, full of the holy spirit and God's love and goodness and mercy and his grace. Just absolutely wonderful story of God. Just never leaving or forsaking, 
knowing that he is in the midst of us, comforting us, even at our worst ends, is always there. And I just love that that bit about the uh, the anointing of the oil. I think that was just I think that was just kind of like so moving, so powerful, and uh, you know, just the power of the Holy Spirit just coming upon you in so many different paths of your life. And I believe that you are full of the Holy Spirit. I believe that you're a man of God. I believe that God has chosen you to do his will. I believe that there's greatness in you and God's going to do a mighty work through you. And we're just so blessed as a ministry, you know, to have you uh, on here with us, um, sharing your truth, you know, studying with us, breaking bread with us. And um, it's just been a pleasure. So, yeah, it's absolutely wonderful testimony. And, um, you know, if anybody here really kind of like is, is struggling with any condemnation or struggling with, you know, their situation or circumstances, you know, you gave them a good message. Do you know what I mean? Read your Bible. <laughs> Read your Bible and you'll never feel lonely. You'll never feel lost. You'll never feel out of place. You just need to be picking up the word of God, the word of truth. Hallelujah. So that was absolutely beautiful. Absolutely wonderful message. I really thank you for coming on and sharing that with us this morning. We're so gracious and um, so felt so blessed just listening to you. You know, it was just like calm and it was just like a a beautiful um you you shared that beautiful relationship with god and how he's drawn you close to him that song comes to mind draw me close to you hallelujah thank you jesus for jared thank you for his life even in those times of homelessness of being alone that you have always been with him that you've been leading him and guiding him through the power of your holy spirit i love the way you um, you express the way that God positioned certain people in your life to just kind of like reaffirm you. And you 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 spoke about um living by the law of the Ten Commandments. Hallelujah. Do you know what I mean? I, I didn't even know there was 630 of them until I started getting into my word, the Leviticus word. Do you know what I mean? I always thought there was 10. <laughs> and it was like, yeah, they were there. They were put down there as a guide for us because we could never live up to them. And I love the way that you explained that in your testimony, how you hinged everything on them and then you kept falling short. And the word gave you the revelation. Hallelujah. That was so powerful. I got the revelation revelation when they said there's 632 of them hallelujah them leviticus laws and it was like you know god put them there as a guide hallelujah because man could never live up to them hallelujah so let alone the 10 do you know what i mean i always thought the 10 was hard enough but then 632 of them i'm thinking wow and i only thought it was 10 <laughs> you know <laughs> again do you know what i mean if we're not being in the words you know what i mean taking other people's um 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 take on life there's 10 no read your word you'll see <laughs> hallelujah god bless you so fantastic that was wonderful so if you want to share back please come in and share back with um our brother jaron and um you know we'll we'll um we'll bring the meeting to a close hallelujah just raise your hand and come in mark over to you muted yeah i god bless you jared man that was that was that was beautiful my bro do you know what i mean like i know i know you're a strong you're a strong man in god do you know what i mean i've never seen you without a bible to be fair every time i we we meet up you've always got your your bible handy we will always learn a little something from you first thing that comes out of your mouth is um what have you been reading do you understand like um and it's nice to be able to like just sit and converse and chop up the word from time to time. Like it's only the other day we were sat sat in the park. Do you know what I mean? Who would imagine that? Sitting in the park, two Bibles, just sitting there reading our Bible, just giving God the grace. And I really heard like Romans eight in your in your message there, bro. Do you know what I mean? Like life through the Holy Spirit, and to hear how obviously life's been been challenging and stuff like that, and how you understand that the reason for why you've able to come to this place where you are today and, and, and walk by, walk by faith, not by sight, bro, is because you have an understanding, you have a relationship with God, you understand? And you're able to just surrender and repent and just, just ask him to guide you and just, 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 just walk with the Holy Spirit. You know what I mean, rather than on your own, your own understanding. And obviously like the way, the way you was explaining about, um, 
stomping around yeah, in 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 a, in a rainstorm like it's just 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 speaking the word of god over yourself and stuff like that bro like some people might look at you and thought you know what? look at this madman bro yeah <laughs> and 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 for me personally i, I might have even thought that at some time but when i when i think about that situation bro i see that as like it's almost like a test bro it's almost like a a, a test of your faith and for you to great gain an understanding of like that you can do all things through him that gives you strength to understand in this um it's been a beautiful thing to meet you guys do you know what I mean and when when I met you and 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 Stephen and and Oscar and stuff and we went and we had a coffee after after the meeting that we have to go to bro like obviously the way you was hitting me with scripture and stuff like that it was just it was just a blessing bro so Thank you very much for for sharing your 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 testimony, bro. Like, I'm sure it's gonna help a lot of people. And God bless you, my bro. You're muted, Ivor. Matter is coming. Is your hand up? Well, it was by accident, but uh, by, the, by the grace of God. Okay. Uh, blessings uh, to you all, and uh, Jaron Winter there, uh, thank you very, very much. Oh. Hmm. Yeah. Um, well, very uh, graceful and very uh, blessed, uh, and uh, just wonderful to be here again uh, with. Uh, Master Aaron of the Faith Walk Ministries and uh, listening uh, to your uh, testimony, uh, Master Jaron Winter Tear, and uh, this uh, that uh, we are all one as uh, as addicts, uh, alcoholics, uh, whatever, and uh, that uh, the story, your personal story, it uh, is uh, our story of uh, finding. Uh, Finding the church and uh, being guided uh, and uh, being found, uh, lost and found, uh, we are as, uh, homeless, uh, sinful uh, people uh, addicted uh, to uh, the quick fixes uh, and uh, our, our our ways of somehow controlling uh, this uh, this crazy, uh, dysfunctional, very painful, uh, excruciating, uh, painful world. And uh, being uh, thrown uh, into the abyss, uh, no, not uh, out of our choice, but out of fate. And uh, then uh, having the, the glorious luck uh, to be found and uh, to uh, get uh, this uh, chance uh, of redemption and uh, becoming uh, one, becoming back uh, into what uh, we were supposed uh, to be, uh, what uh, God ordained us uh, to be when we were born. And uh, it's just wonderful. It is uh, your resolve, and uh, uh, keep keep on uh, struggling. And it is the only solution is in the Bible. It is uh, the most clear cut uh, set uh, of uh, directions. It is uh, the manual, and uh, especially uh, to follow Christ. And uh, when I was listening uh, to you, I uh, immediately thought uh, of. Uh, Matthew 19, uh, verses 16 to 22, about uh, this uh, man, this very rich man that uh, wanted to follow uh, Jesus and asked uh, what to do. And uh, Jesus uh, answered him with the law, uh, it, it combined with uh, the, 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 the openness, the receptiveness uh, to Paracletos, uh, the Holy Spirit. And then the, this poor man uh, couldn't uh, go with him because he had too many possessions. He was uh, too addicted uh, to the wealth of uh, Mammon. And uh, well, this poor man uh, couldn't follow. But uh, it is uh, up to us uh, and it's up to me most uh, personally. And this is what's happening right now. That uh, I will be, I am a monk and uh, I will now uh, live just uh, overly uh, to uh, follow the path of uh, Jesus Christ. And uh, they, exactly now I've had um, a very excruciating time uh, being assaulted uh, by the devil uh, in persons of people really, really, really grievously needing and wanting 
uh, the solution that is offered uh, in the Bible and uh, by the by, by us uh, the disciples, uh, but uh, they cannot because they are just too stuck uh, to their pain and to their solutions. But uh, well, never give up. And uh, this uh, this special person uh, came back this morning, and uh, we prayed uh, together and. Um, it will happen. It is uh, this like uh, what it is in the the big book uh, that uh, if uh, somebody uh, is clearly willing but unable to send them back uh, to the bar, and uh, maybe that the person will find a rock bottom. And uh, given uh, the the big book and reading the big book, uh, that uh, I'm reading especially this, the personal stories. Uh, that person will come back at the moment uh, that that person finds out that the only solution is with us, uh, carrying the message uh, of uh, recovery. Uh, and for me, uh, most especially with the big book uh, and the, this Bible, and I've got this crazy special Bible, this life recovery Bible. This is just the most uh, wonderful Bible. Uh, it's a really a 12-step Bible too with it's, it's astoundingly well written and uh, it's astoundingly clear guide uh, to redemption and ascension and uh, being a true follower of Christ uh, going into the world and uh, there carry the message, carry the light and be the fishermen and uh, be the carpenters too, that they may build their home for God, their, their altars and be a fisherman too. Thank you very much, Jaron. Thank you very much, Aaron. And thank you much, very much, all people here gathered. I wish you a blessed day. And uh, that's it. Thank you very much. Amen. Amen. Bless you, brother. Good to see you. And always good to have you with us. So bless you, brother. And uh, keep on keeping on doing the work of Christ where you are in the Netherlands. May God bless you, brother. Amen. Anybody else want to come in and share? Good morning. Good morning. Um, Jared, thank you for a lovely story. Um, how the uh, Holy Spirit was coming into your life through the course of, you know, such trials that you faced as you were trying to find a path out of the sh shadow of the valley of death and being led onto the narrow path. And uh, I picked up your story in Croydon because I, I remember about seven years ago I was doing outreach on the streets of Croydon and I might have come across one of those people that you mentioned at the uh, food bank or the, uh, you know, because I remember being ministered to as well, even while I was doing the outreach, trying to help others. You know, I still hadn't found the Lord by it back then. And uh, it just goes to show that we may meet the most amazing people uh, at times we would never expect. And how they, we remember them years later on our journey, you know, and these were instruments of God trying to, to point us off towards the narrow path. And uh, yeah, thank you for reminding me of that and that I should be grateful for all of those signs. You know, despite my own self-will taking over and choosing to remain in that shadow of the valley of death because I didn't know anything else. I didn't know what the narrow path was like. I often find my path. I'm still finding, you know, it's a daily, daily reprieve. You know, this is a daily work, you know, whether it's the scripture, prayer, fellowship, uh, doing the Lord's work, bringing others into the fold, you know, it's, it's, it's not my job to save. I am just a vessel, a humble vessel of, of the Lord. Thank you. Amen. Amen to that. Good to see you, brother. Good to hear you. And um, may God bless you too. In the name of Jesus. Yes, anybody else want to share before we close? 
How about we go straight into prayer? Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Father God, for that wonderful testimony, Lord. We thank you for this time in you. Thank you, Jesus, Lord, that you just can bless each and every single one of us. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy that follows us all the days of our lives. That though we walk through the shadow of the valley of death, that we shall fear no evil. That your rod will continue to comfort each and every single one of us. Father, we thank you, Lord, as we just come to you today. We thank you, Lord, that you are the one that draws us, Lord. It's not by works, as my brother says. It's by you drawing through your grace, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Father, Lord, as we just come before you today, let's just lift up our voices and let's just pray. Dear Lord Jesus, repeat after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins. I believe you rose from the dead. I turn from my sins and invite you to come into my heart and my life. I want to trust you more. I want to go deeper in you. I want to know more about you. Empower me today and enrich me and infill me with your Holy Spirit. Father, Lord, I ask for that fresh anointing to come into me here today. Hallelujah. That fresh fire from above. Lift me up, Lord, in the name of Jesus. Elevate me. Quicken me in my heart and my mind. Reveal your truths to me. Open up my heart and my eyes to see what you want me to see. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Guide me, O oh Lord. Guide me in my recovery. Show me how to live. Be a lamp to my path and a light to my feet. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. May God bless you. May God keep you. May God continue to shine his face upon each and every single one of you and give you his peace and assurance. Blessings. Thank you, Brother Jaron. Thank you, everybody, this morning. Andy, lovely to see you. Hope to see you again. Our next meeting is on Monday night, back into the book of Revelations. I believe it's Revelations 20. No meeting on Sunday. We'll be in um, David's tent uh, for 72 hours of worship. We ain't got no internet connection in there, so hallelujah. Hopefully, we'll be coming back with some fresh fire on Monday evening. Hallelujah. Fresh wind to the meeting. So look forward to seeing you on Monday at 8 p.m. Please join us in the book of Revelations, Revelations 20, and that's Monday at 8 p.m. God bless you. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Thanks, Jaron. Thanks, Ivan. God bless you all. God bless you all. Take care.